Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the DASH webinar series. My name is Megan Diamond, and I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Innovation at the Harvard Global Health Institute. I'm excited to welcome you here today for what is our final webinar of the series, The Role of AI in the Post-Pandemic Era. This webinar is the eighth in a series co-hosted by the Novartis Foundation and MIT Critical Data, which is bringing together experts from around the world to explore the role of tech in AI in the response to COVID-19, with a specific focus in low resource settings or those with high socioeconomic disparity. While this is our last webinar, we encourage you to check our website at dashinafrica.org, where we have recordings of all of our previous discussions and where you'll be able to find future information about events and activities that are part of the data science and AI summits for healthcare. In many countries around the world, COVID-related restrictions that were once put in place to curb the spread of the virus are now being lifted. For policymakers, innovators, and researchers who quickly leverage digital tools and AI as part of the acute response, this could mean rethinking and pivoting priorities. As the world transitions to the next phase of the response and beyond, the question remains, what is the role of digital tools in AI in a post-pandemic world? In this webinar, we bring together panelists with a diverse range of expertise in AI and data science who collectively think on how we can continue to move through and forward in the COVID-19 crisis. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping notes. This video is being live, stream, live streamed through Zoom, Facebook Live, and a recording will be made available on the DASH website shortly afterwards. We're going to be running a live Q&A um, at the end of the webinar, so we've enabled an ask a function, uh, ask a question feature rather, on the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can just pop them in there and we'll do our very best to answer them. We've also enabled the chat function, which will be monitored and overseen by my colleague, Caroline. When using this function, please make sure you set the message recipient as everyone and not just the panelists, so everyone can see your question and the answers. To get us started, we'd like to invite all of our participants to use the chat functionality to let us know where you are connecting from today, including the city and the country. So I'm connecting today from Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. So with that, let me introduce our panelists. We have Dr. Jansu Janja. She's a philosopher and the founder and director of the AI Ethics Lab, where, her team, where she leads a team of computer scientists, philosophers and legal scholars to provide ethics analysis and guidance to researchers and practitioners. She primarily, she primarily works on ethics of technology, having previously worked on ethics in health. Prior to the AI Ethics Lab, she was a lecturer at the University of Hong Kong and a researcher at Harvard Law School, Harvard School of Public Health, Harvard Medical School, the National University of Singapore, Osaka University, and the World Health Organization. She holds a PhD in philosophy, specializing in applied ethics. Next, we have Dr. Leo Anthony Selly, who is an ICU doctor who has practiced medicine in three continents, giving him broad perspectives in healthcare delivery. As clinical research director and principal research scientist at the MIT Laboratory for Computational Physiology, and as an attending physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, he brings together clinicians and data scientists to support research using data routinely collected in the process of care. He is a co course director for two courses at MIT, Global Health Informatics to Improve Quality of Care and Collaborative Data Science and Medicine. Next, we have Dr. Edson Amaro Jr., who is currently a professor in the Department of Radiology at the University of Sao Paulo, an honorary lecturer at King's College in the University of London. Edson is responsible for big data analytics and is a neuroradiologist in the Department of Imaging at Albert Einstein Hospital. He has published more than 180 articles in specialized journals and has worked with over 400 collaborators in the co-authorship of scientific works. And lastly, we have our moderator, Kirsten Gagnier, who is a Seattle area native and passionate advocate for women and girls issues globally. 
Kirsten's work concentrates on culturally relevant technology for social impact, focusing on girls and women's empowerment applications for effectively educating communities and maximizing outcomes for the underserved across the globe. She is an innovator and social enterprise thought leader, having developed and led groundbreaking business models in partnerships with global multi-sectoral organizations, including governments, corporate, United Nations agencies, and grassroots social entrepreneurs. With that, I'm going to hand the mic over to Kirsten, who will be leading the discussion today. Great, thank you, Megan. It's a pleasure to be here and um, an honor to be with these amazing panelists today. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from around the world. Um, I'd like to just start by having each of you um, give us a little bit of context for how you're addressing COVID in your work right now. So Leo, maybe if you could get us started. Sure. Um, hello from Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. Um, I, I'm, my name is Leo. I'm an intensive care unit or ICU doctor, as Megan said, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, one of the teaching hospitals of Harvard Medical School. Um, during the surge here in Massachusetts, we saw a number of ICU beds from 70 to 140 to meet the increased demand. At our peak in April, we had more than 100 patients with COVID in the ICU, the majority requiring a ventilator. Uh, but with a strict shelter in place and use of masks, it took us about eight weeks from our peak to bring our census down to pre-COVID. Our research focus is on the application of data science to health-related data to understand and model health and disease better. Uh, we build and share with the rest of the research community large high-resolution data sets from electronic health records. The Medical Information Mart for Intensive Care, or MIMIC, contains the identified data from patients who are admitted to the ICUs of Beth Israel Deaconess. Um, MIMIC 3 was released in 2016 and has produced more than 1,000 publications and conference proceedings. MIMIC 4, the next iteration, will be released very soon with data through 2018. Um, another data set, the EICU Collaborative Research Database, has data from more than 200,000 ICU patients from 208 hospitals across the United States. And finally, MIMIC CXR has 350,000 chest x-rays labeled with a radiologist report for computer vision and natural language processing research. We have approved more than 15,000 accredited users of these three data sets. Uh, we teach courses at, at MIT on global health informatics and health data science. And we also organize these events called datathons around the world to bring together the computer scientists, the engineers, and the clinicians. Uh, we have a number of COVID research projects. We are working with different state public health departments to examine the drivers of cases and excess deaths during the pandemic, linking census data with mobility data, county level policy implementations, news coverage and social media posts, and pretty much whatever data we could get our hands on to disentangle correlations from mediation to causation. We are also working with colleagues in Brazil, Spain, Italy, Korea, and Australia, and examining patient level electronic health records. Finally, we have a project looking at the quality of research preprint publications during the pandemic. Thanks. Great, thanks, Leo. We'll look forward to hearing more about how you're using those data sets. Um, but for now, we'll go over to one of your colleagues in Brazil. Edson, could you tell us a little bit about how you're um, addressing COVID in your work right now? You're, sorry, Edson, you're muted. The usual there you mute, go. Usual <laughs> mute thing. So uh, thanks for uh, the invitation. So I work in an institution that is actually um, a large hospital with many satellite units, and we run a big data analytics team here. So I'm responsible for that initiative. We started working with data in public health also. So it's not only internal to the hospital, but also in programs with the National um, Ministry of Health and also the state of Sao Paulo. So I'm in Sao Paulo right now. So in the middle of the uh, pandemic in, in, in the country, at the moment we have uh, 1.6 million people uh, detected and uh, the number of death. It's um, at this moment something between 65,000 as we speak. So we're still in the middle of it. So no, no signs of getting out of the pandemic uh, at least so soon. 
Um, what we've been doing so far, we've been uh, working again with the government and uh, we've been developing tools to help the, uh, the, the public health system to um, face the challenges of deploying resources and also detecting the vulnerable population in, in the national territory. So uh, the tools we've been developed and so far are based on georeferency statistics plus the uh, usual predictive analytics that I would say that uh, it's been uh, quite challenging because since we developed some uh, model, the government changes the policies and then it, it becomes quite hard to use. So we're using a short-term forecast and this has been quite successful in planning deployment for resources and identifying and where we should act more soon. I, would, I should say that we also, um, we've been working with um, situations which the patient is seeing a doctor or a medical professional in which um, we hope to help them to uh, make decisions related to who should uh, go to the ICU or use some uh, mechanical respiratory um, assessment or even acute kidney insufficiency because it's been quite frequent in, in Brazil, around 40 to 50 percent of all patients in the uh, uh, artificial respiratory machine also will demand uh, some support for their kidneys. So uh, we have this scenario that, th that is within the hospital and then you have the population scenario. And, uh, and then there's the uh, usual idea that we, we should look at the um, long-term effects. So the post uh, pandemic effects. So we've been trying to help the, the, the policies on, on the state of Sao Paulo in which we have been uh, quite successful showing that use of masks would be quite beneficial. And I think this, this has been some of a of our initiatives that have been, uh, been used by the government as one of the ways for making decisions. So I hope to contribute with the discussion with our experience down here in Brazil. Great, thanks Edson. We'll look forward to hearing more from you. And John Su, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, thanks for inviting me as well. So I am in, uh, I'm calling from Turkey, uh, a little town called Dacia, for those who know where, what I'm talking about. It's a southern town. Um, so what we have been doing during the pandemic, uh, well, during the peak of the pandemic and now is uh, focusing mainly on the tr uh, tracing aspect. So as we all know, the, the three main areas of focus for the controlling the pandemic has been the testing, tracing, and the isolation. And somehow not really by choice, but um, we got, um, I got uh, very focused on the tracing aspect, starting from the manual tracing. So I come from ethics of health. So not, not like initially from ethics and health and then ethics of technology. So my first attention was about the manual contact tracing, how we do the traditional contact tracing and what is um, not working so well in our current uh, pandemic due to the scale and the, the type of uh, disease that we are talking about. Um, and from there, seeing the um, shortcomings of the manual contact tracing and the ethical questions that it um, raises, um, I got more and more involved in the digital contact tracing. So um, this has been the main uh, question that we've been dealing with from the ethics perspective. So our work is mainly focused on the ethics of AI and technology. And now with the intersection of health, again, as I said, it's, it's comfortable because that's, that's the background that I come from and a lot of my colleagues come from. Um, and, uh, but so this is not, uh, even though this has been the main focus, we also have been looking at the, some other um, tools that are coming out throughout this period. Um, one of them is the wearables and the smart homes, the Internet of Things that are being um, more and more explored for um, early detection of the, uh, of the, the uh, symptoms or early detection uh, of the uh, uh, community symptoms, but also in, in terms of smart homes, how to do the isolation, especially for seniors, uh, safely in their homes. Um, this comes uh, conveniently because we worked on uh, variables before. Um, this is just another aspect of the similar questions. And the questions that we are talking about in most of these um, uh, technologies is uh, basically in, in two main areas. One is the ethical design. How can we make sure that these systems, whether it is digital tracking, contact tracing, digital contact tracing, or the wearables, are designed in a way that are ethical um, and also a lot of other questions related to the um, data and the, the, the algorithms, uh, which leads us to these questions about the um, accuracy of data, the, um, the biases that might 
might uh, come uh, smuggle into the data. Um, the, uh, the relation of um, ethics and technology and health is uh, something that um, I think we need to sort of, when we are talking about in the, in the context of pandemic, we need to keep in mind um, in terms of comparing to the alternatives. A lot of the times of the, the um, discussion about the ethics of technologies in this uh, very unusual time is comparing the situation to normalcy, which is not what we are talk, starting from. So um, it's important when we are discussing um, these ethical questions and something that we've been a little bit struggling with is to understand that the um, demands of our current circumstances and see what technological solutions we could come up with. And, and one more thing about this is that um, we, should, we also need to understand that a lot of the traditional methods that we have have been um, insufficient in dealing with this pandemic. So again, from an ethics perspective, I can say that we have an ethical duty to find innovations, to, deal, to come up with solutions to these problems. But it is very, very important to make sure that these solutions don't cause more harm e either during the pandemic or by creating tools that are um, powerful, but also uh, open to misuse and abuse after the pandemic. So I'll leave it at this for now. Great, thanks, John Sue. So we'll just get started um, caring from what you were just talking about. So as you note, there's kind of this um, balancing act between this being an extraordinary time and very much needing to get um, innovations out as rapidly as possible. Um, however, the ethical considerations um, are, are huge in, in this work. So how do you balance those two things? What are the ethical considerations that should be adhered to, even if it means that some of the um, critical innovations don't get out as quickly? And then what's the result if these ethical frameworks aren't adhered to? Um, so I'm going to um, answer your question, to, to be concrete, I'm going to answer your question uh, from this contact tracing, digital contact tracing uh, work that we've been involved with. Um, so I think um, it's very um, important, as, again, to recognize that um, we can do things fast. Um, and I think this contact tracing has been a good example of uh, how things can happen fast. So it's not always a huge, um, um, what do you call it? Like a huge trade-off between speed versus uh, life's loss. So what happened in the digital contact tracing, for example, was that immediately as the need for uh, some, some technological uh, tool that could help us with the contact tracing became apparent, um, a lot of different groups around the world have started working on uh, building digital contact tracing uh, protocols. And uh, literally around the world. So in Cambridge, of course, MIT, uh, MIT started with, uh, with it and, the, and Stanford on the other coast, but also in, in, in Canada, everywhere. Singapore was the first one that implemented it. Um, and a lot, immediately after it took off, immediately after, um, the ethical questions uh, rose, uh, arose. And, and that became a immediately a part of the protocol. So we, I cannot say that we really lost time by um, designing these systems as what, the, what we call privacy preserving. So the privacy preserving protocols have been out there for a while now. I believe the um, initial release of them was either late March or early April, way before um, the, the contact tracing apps have been used, except with the exception of Singapore, because they released it um, earlier than that. Um, and the, uh, so the trade-off was not huge, let's say, um, in terms of speed. But think about what is the um, trade-off if you don't think about privacy or the ethical aspect. So the, what is at stake is basically if we get it wrong, if we create a tool that allows um, agents, uh, could be health authorities, could be outside agents, to be able to see where individuals go, who they interact with, uh, for how long. This is extremely important information and very intimate information. And um, you can think of a lot of oppressive governments who would love to have it, this information at their disposal with a very conveniently built tool. Um, so the, what is at stake is giving enormous amount of power to either a private company or to the um, governmental agents if the privacy uh, aspect was not incorporated into these tools. 
Um, so um, I think when we think about these um, technologies, the important thing to um, keep in mind is there will always be trade-offs. We will always have to um, think about different um, demands, uh, either for privacy, um, in this case, because of the reasons that I explained, or the transparency, um, because you might say, hey, this, this private uh, digital, contact, digital or normal contact tracing is not working. We need, uh, we, we need to uh, understand the trade-off between public health and privacy, so we choose public health, which is not a route that we want to go if we can avoid, um, or uh, between saving lives and staying uh, in a lockdown, uh, so a freedom, our freedom. So um, understanding all these trade-offs, um, if we can find a solution that um, satisfies all of them, that's fantastic. And digital contact tracing, privacy preserving digital contact tracing has been almost like this uh, great scenario. Um, but a lot of the times, things are not that perfect. We still have to live with certain trade-offs. And there, the, 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 import, the, the thing to do is to um, really make sure that we analyze all the ethical questions that a tool, a technology is raising, um, eliminate as many of them as possible through, with collaboration with the technologists so that we can uh, do design changes, data changes, algorithmic changes. Um, to get rid of some of the ethical questions, and if it's still there's still a trade-off, then uh, choose the best one that we can uh, we can have. Great, thank you, John Sue. Um, well, we'll kind of carry on that theme with trade-offs. Um, Leo, as an intensive care specialist, can you tell us how AI is being used to predict survival models as well as other applications for directly treating patients? And along that vein of considering the trade-offs, what are the trade-offs that are specific to applying AI? Um, in these ways? Sure, uh, Kirsten. So the, the pandemic really has strained health system capacity everywhere. And it didn't just affect the low resource countries, but high resource countries as well. And there have been discussions around allocation of limited resources, such as intensive care unit beds and mechanical ventilators. Uh, it's heightened interest in survival prediction models, mortality prediction models, to inform decisions around patient triage. Models predicting survival among patients hospitalized with the infection flooded preprint servers. They were published after expedited peer reviews. But can a model trained on a Chinese, Italian, or American cohort be applied elsewhere? More importantly, what do these models really predict? And the answer to this question strongly depend upon context. So a significant number of hospitalized patients who die get admitted to the ICU. And for the vast majority of individuals who die in the ICU, their death is a result of cessation of treatments. Many factors impact the decision to discontinue invasive interventions, including whether the outcome, if the patient were to survive, is aligned with the patient's preferences. In this context, a machine learning model predicting hospital mortality is largely identifying which patients are most likely to have their treatments discontinued. Therefore, it will only be accurate in a setting where clinicians make predictions in a similar manner, where patients share the same values and preferences around quality of life, and where the decision-making process resembles that of the training cohort. Accuracy of algorithms are limited by time and space. The idea of companies and startups selling AI algorithms and hospitals buying and deploying them without meticulous evaluation, recalibration, and a mechanism to continuously monitor their performance is unsafe and will harm the field. Let's go back to the survival prediction model example. The first question that is most relevant when one is building mortality prediction is, what will the model be used for? Will it help identify those who are in need of a higher level of care? If so, one should prioritize recall or sensitivity in choosing the best model. You don't want to miss a patient who might benefit from a care in a tertiary referral center. On the other hand, if the model will be consulted to inform a decision to admit a patient to the ICU when there are not enough beds, then precision or positive predictive value is more important. You cannot afford to be wrong. You don't want to deny an ICU bed to someone who may survive. So deep interrogation of the algorithms is required to ensure that its performance is consistent across different populations. 
We don't want these algorithms to magnify even further the biases that make their way into clinical decision making as well as health policy making. The generation of medical knowledge has a long tradition of being skewed by the exclusion of certain populations in clinical trials and observational studies, including minority populations and women. From a global perspective, what we know in medicine has been dominated by research performed in a handful of countries. With digitalization of health records, there is an opportunity to model health and disease in every country. At present, training data for machine learning only come from a handful of countries. Data scientists flock to domains where curated data exists. The vast majority of algorithms are being developed for image-based specialties because they have the data. We are drowning in mortality prediction, hospital readmission, and fal false alarm reduction algorithms. But are these the tools that would have the most impact on population health? Where are the decision support instruments to optimize prevention and screening? How can deep learning prevent treatment injuries and medical errors? The obstacles to advanced medical AI that we are encountering during and we will encounter after the pandemic are a mere continuation of the same challenges that we faced before the pandemic. Thanks. Great, thank you, Leo. So Edson, we'll go over to you and in your context, you're using big data solutions and um, my understanding is one of the things that you're doing is really looking to be able to identify vulnerable populations. Um, how can big data solutions help monitor population health? Um, and what are the restrictions of this? And what is your experience with big data solutions for COVID-19 been? And how might we be able to extend the use of these later after the pandemic? Uh, thanks. Um, I think there's um, at least two points that I'd like to explore in that context. The first one is the uh, continuation of what Leo just mentioned, which is we need to, to have contextualized solutions. So I don't think there is one size fits all, um, mainly due to uh, particularly in Brazil to inequality that we face um, in, in our territory and many other countries. The second thing that I'd like to explore is the uh, data literacy. So it's not only the case that the algorithms uh, should, again, and, and must actually be uh, supervised by um, uh, a, a careful um, distinction of what it does in terms of mathematics and what it does in terms of people's lives. And also, I think we should uh, uh, also monitor the humans that are making decisions based on those algorithms. Are they aware of the, uh, the main challenges and limitations of the tools that they are now uh, having their hands. So uh, I think there's a, uh, a huge uh, point here in which we, we might actually increase the gap between the, uh, the disqualified use of AI uh, uh, solutions uh, by simply not, not knowing exactly what is it for. So let me go back to the first point, which is um, actually how we um, contextualize solutions in the country. So first, we, we need to have a public health system that is able to adapt to local needs. For instance, in, in our country, in Brazil, um, we, we, we know that socioeconomic status is a huge um, uh, uh, factor in determining the, the health risks of many um, vulnerable populations. For instance, in certain areas of, 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 of the country, education is a major factor. In other areas, education is so poor that it's not the main factor. The main factor is actual access to clean water. And so how do you um, interact with a system that has to uh, work in, in a very poor area and at the same time we have certain areas like in Sao Paulo and you definitely can compare it to New York so there's, there's no big relationship between the, the social risk factors in health in major cities in, 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 in Brazil and in some developing countries compared to uh, to the, the, the already developed and, and high income countries. So, so the point would be, how do you get your technical solutions to operate in, in conjunction and, and to collaborate with the health system? So one thing that we worked here was to, to, to realize that community health agents are, are really uh, a, a very powerful resource in healthcare. So having a person that lives in the community that knows each other, I mean, uh, in Brazil, the system is, uh, is a little bit unbalanced, but usually one person has to visit between 200 and 400 uh, 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 people. And usually when you're talking about a family, it's not a hard work because every day you visit between uh, four to uh, 15 or 12 families in your work. 
So basically, you, you are able to engage, have a human engagement with the population at scale. So for instance, we're talking about something around 112 million people that are seen once a month by a community health agent. So uh, that enables you to give, for instance, interactive tools like tablets or any, any kind of uh, um, uh, IoT device that enables you to get quantitative data and also, you have the human side uh, to use it. So my point then would be, in order to merge solutions like, for instance, predicting the outcome of people with hypertension. So usually they, they are more prone to have you know, uh, strokes and also uh, myocardial infarcts. So the, and this is actually number one cause of death in, in major uh, areas across the globe, including in Brazil. So it would be very helpful to predict the outcome in primary care of, care of chronic patients including in the pandemic, because these people are more susceptible to the disease. And in fact, the, 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 the average age of, of, of patients in Brazil actually is lower than the European patients, um, somehow because the European patients are older in general than the Brazilian population. But the funny thing is that our population is aging so fast that we are aging 20 years what Europeans age in 200 years. So the, 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 the transition of the population uh, uh, demographics plus the pandemic, plus the social inequity, make, makes us uh, believe that this tool that is the, the social agent interacting with um, the, the uh, ability to predict outcomes is actually a major force. So in order to do that, what we did was we developed a solution that is portable, so the community health agents can actually consult this. And at the same time, we train them how to use this. In other words, basically what we did is like, you have to point out when is the best time to see a doctor. This is for chronic conditions everywhere else. But during the pandemic, the idea would be, should you test for COVID or not, even though you're not symptomatic? What are the measures you should take in, in different areas in the country? So interacting with this heterogeneous condition makes you think that in certain urban areas, it's much easier to see a doctor or a health agent if you feel some symptoms that might be prone you to test for COVID, but in certain areas, there's no choice to see anybody actually. So you have to think about where you should send these people to, not only one guy. So and then you're helping to organize the human resource or the, the, the force in certain areas. In other areas, you already have the system ready. So sometimes you have to use your predictive uh, uh, analytics to help them to optimize the referencing system for patients. In some other areas, there's actually not need to do so because it's already set up. So it's, it's not like that every, in every country, but in Brazil, it's a particular situation where we have this, I think it's the largest, actually, I'm sure it's the largest public health system in the world. So we are able to reach communities almost everywhere. Every city has a representation and we have the data. But again, the idea is to interact with an heterogeneous scenario. So the challenges we face, again, and there's the indigenous population, which is a particular chapter that is very uh, important to take care of. So you have this population, this, it's a very high risk. Again, you have this urban area. So how do you work with these things? So again, we have to rely on humans knowing how to use the technology. So the idea is to empower the community health agents to use the technology and at the same time, let the government notice what is the effect of an engaging uh, new technology, new tools to monitor the populations and to make sure that you have this geo-referenced um, vulnerable areas uh, on the plan and they are actually now being seen by people and sending resources, for instance, the mechanical respiratory system is distributed in certain institutes using a crit criticity index that is based on socioeconomic status, the prediction of outcomes, that goes into, in, into play, and also the rate of the surrounding uh, um, death rate above the expected chance. So you have, if, if you have these two things together, the history, the current death rate, and the future predictions in one solution, then it can actually help to face the, the different context, and also at the same time, using simple, a very simple um, device to guide them in the actions when they're working at the front. So I think it's a, it's a mix, it's a bag of things, it, there's not, only single solution, but the mindset is you have to adapt to local needs and you have to train people. So that, that these are the two main lessons we learned here. Thank you, Edson. That's, those are important reminders. And um, 
John Sue, I just want to put another question back to you, building off of what Edson and Leo were just saying about the importance of context um, and the importance of the human aspect. Um, you know, the algorithms are only as smart as the information that goes in. And what kind of systems need to be put in place now and going forward to both ensure privacy, but also to make sure that the tools aren't amplifying and reinforcing discrimination and disparities, as Edson was just talking about? Um, yeah, so there are two ways of thinking about this and um, two ways that must uh, go together, actually. One is uh, the boundaries, boundaries of what, uh, what must be done, what must be uh, outside of uh, the sphere of things that, that can be done in terms of like collecting data, privacy, how the, the, not the minimum ways of at least cleaning your data and so on. And certain things should be regulated because um, the most important thing is that you cannot have a, um, a fair fight, fair uh, competition among uh, developers if you expect some of them to be ethical and some of them just shrug and say, we don't care. So you need like at least to um, have a fair competition, you have to have certain regulations in place. But regulations should not be um, about every single detail. That would be terrible. That would completely block uh, the, the way that uh, the speed of the um, technology. And also this is not what we do, like in, in medicine as well. You don't have every, uh, every decision is not regulated. You have regulations about, again, the boundaries, the limits of what should be done. And then there are everyday decisions. And there you have ethical uh, judgments. And I, I find it um, easier to talk to people from health about the ethics of technology, because I think health is one of those um, rare areas where you have very good um, history and culture of uh, collaboration between ethicists and the professionals, the, the practitioners. Um, so think about just like um, the, uh, the, the questions that arise in, in healthcare. So you have the policy questions. What is the, the um, right, just uh, policy to implement, health policy to implement? And you also have like case questions in the hospital as you are doing your everyday job. It's similar thing with the ethics of technology. Um, you have questions that will arise from the very beginning of the um, the, the research phase of the technology all the way to the um, releasing the product. So um, the questions will, well, let me pr first say like the categories of questions. So you will have uh, in any technology development, as you mentioned, um, you will have questions related to data. What kind of data is the um, appropriate one? How do you make sure that it's not biased? All of these questions go into the ethical issues related to data. Then you have the algorithm related ethical questions. Which type of algorithms should you be using? Which ones are the appropriate ones? Um, is it right to use this type of algorithm? Let's say the a neural network that you really don't know what's going on in, inside um, under, for this particular purpose. Um, then you have the, the design questions of the tool. The privacy preserving question, privacy by design goes in there. Um, but also things like how do you get consent from your users going there? What, how do you create the tool itself? And finally, you have questions related to practice that, um, that was mentioned earlier as well. How do you make sure that those who are using this tool to, let's say, provide healthcare, understand what this tool does? Uh, what, is the, what, what, what is this tool useful for and where it is, um, it is questionable? Where does it fall short? Without understanding that you really rely on some magic numbers coming from the tool or magic judgments coming from the tool rather than having a meaningful um, interaction, meaningful usage of, this, uh, of these tools. And in order to look at all these questions, you realize they run through all stages of research and development and, and release. So like, you will have to start from the protocol, research protocol, to the, the design, um, to the uh, the creation of the tool and the up and release and updating and how do we make sure um, we can answer these questions about you know the um about everything that that um that goes into um these um aspects like for example uh you guys already mentioned the vulnerable populations how can we make sure that a tool is uh, suitable for vulnerable population these are questions that public health experts have been debating for a long time. So now think about it 
this one aspect of um, health ethics that has been a little bit left out, which is what goes, what type of decisions go into the ethical decisions that go into the health technologies. Um, basically, the, idea, the, the structure is similar. You collaborate with the technologists, ethicists, um, those are like philosophers, um, and the practitioners, domain practitioners, the, the healthcare providers, um, to detect the ethical questions um, early on um, and find solutions for them. I, I realize that we are running out of time, so I stop yeah. here. <laughs> I know, thank you. I know you all have so much to say. I'm going to ask one more quick question of Leo. And um, then I know that we've got a few great questions that are coming through the chat as well. So Leo, um, you know, we just heard John Sue talk about the ethical issues and how it goes through the all of the stages of development. Um, we've seen, especially during COVID, that um, you know, given there, that there's kind of been a rush to get pre-review articles out. Um, into the public eye. How has that impacted AI models? And how might we like better be able to balance the need to get information out quickly with the data to be accurate, viable, and applicable to the context, which are broader than where the research may have occurred? So the pandemic has highlighted several fault lines in medicine. The first fault line is that most doctors do not have time to critically analyze every study, and most actually do not have the skills to do so. They rely on the vanguards and stewards of medical knowledge, the leaders of professional societies, the editors of medical journals, the investigators with the most citations, who sometimes have conflicts of interest. Uh, the second fault line is that even the most well-intentioned scientists can be led astray. And the third fault line highlighted by the pandemic is the role that media plays in hyping science and so-called experts who purvey it without regard to the quality of the underlying studies. Uh, everyone's heard of several high profile retractions of studies where it seems that apart from the few who performed the analysis or the modeling, no one else, including the other authors had access to the raw data. And we were thinking that if only journals mandate sharing of the identified data and the queries used to perform the analysis, there will be less temptation to get the a priori intended results, whether that is a statistical significance or a near perfect model accuracy. Our group are, is fierce advocates of open science and reproducibility as a priority over sensational findings and perfect models. When investigators request access to our databases, they agree to share their codes and queries upon publication of their work. We have a repository of reusable codes and concept definitions to allow replication of analysis and the modeling. And most importantly, the sharing of the code repository and notebooks lowers the cost of doing research by making it easier to build up on existing analysis. Lastly, this model of open data and code sharing provides the requisite transparency to build societal trust. We can never move forward if society does not trust what we are doing, if society does not believe that we are here to improve population outcomes. Great, thanks Leo. Um, I think I'll move to some of the uh, questions from all of you in the audience. So one that just came through is, what are the most critical collaborations to ensure ethical development of AI tools and how do we meaningfully engage with local experts? And what are the risks if we don't? Maybe Edson, I'll put that one to you. Well, not so sure. So sure I'm the one to answer that, but okay. I, I can definitely say that uh, this is a very relevant question. Um, let me put you in a way that you should make a decision to use an algorithm. So let's try to make a one-to-one -one choice, right? You have a, an, an algorithm that will help you to decide if somebody needs a uh, support for a kidney function in an ICU. Okay, this person might or might not survive for the next three or four days without this machine, but you have to make a decision anyways. There's nothing else but yourself. There's no extra thing to help you to do that. Uh, so how, how would you decide based on our experience, I suppose? And perhaps you can chat with somebody. But once you have something that you believe this is scientifically proved to be correct, you perhaps will simply change your own um, responsibility to something else and think, well, this is fair because somebody said it's correct. Somebody said it would be 
okay to use. And this also is efficient. This has cost effect. So there's all sorts of justification that takes your own responsibility from that decision based on a tool. So I think, I'm not so sure if I, I, I addressed the question correctly, but this, this is the kind of situation that I think it becomes very practical in a front line decision. And at that moment, people simply perhaps forgot, forgot what they learn and they forget to think. They just keep on going, make decisions that perhaps in the future they might, they might actually regret. So I'd, I'd like to pass this question to somebody else from yeah. the panel and see what they think about it. Thanks, go ahead. Jansu or Leo? Jansu first. Ahead, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a tough question because it's very, uh, it, it is very context dependent. So yes, the local um, expertise, the domain expertise, you have to engage with all of them, but taking from Edson's example, for, exa for, for instance, um, it is important to allocate, uh, well, not allocate, um, define accountability when you are using uh, the, these tools. So it is important that we don't just say, hey, the computer said so, and I had no reason to doubt it. Well, it, you have to understand what tool you are using and what you should doubt. And in the end, the responsibility lies in the person who is making the decision. So we cannot just outsource our responsibility. We, these tools are useful because we are, as humans, we are, we, we are just not able to make, uh, we are not wired for great statistical thinking and being able to use all sorts of different data to make decisions. So these tools are useful to complement those inabilities of ourselves. But in the end, the decision is ours. So we have to be able to justify in which sense we relied on the tool and in which sense we understood what the tool said and made our decision in the end. So just one little thing, like think about it like the calculator. Um, you know, like the calculator gives you a number and you understand the number, but still the number, you have to use it for certain purposes. And that is your point. That is the responsibility that you're taking. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Yansu. Leo, do you want to try to answer that one as well? Sure. I mean, I'm just going to expand on what Jansu uh, mentioned earlier is that we need to compare AI to the right comparator, which is without AI. And we know that when humans make decisions, we're full of biases. Like when you're making a decision, should I offer dialysis to this patient? There are all sorts of things that go into our mind. And there are all sorts of biases that come to our mind. Is this a person who will contribute to society? Maybe I don't need to extend the life of this person because I don't see him or her contributing much. And those are happening right now. And without a more objective way of making those decisions that are based on some statistics and machine learning, I, I think the status quo is not gonna be any better than one without AI. So I always tell people that one, the status quo is not acceptable. We make so many biased decisions. It's contributed to health inequities. And if there is a way for, for data science to actually address that, to, uh, to highlight our biases, and to make sure that we're making decisions on the, the correct criteria, then I'm all for this. So to me, that, that is always the, 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 the right frame of mind to answer these questions. And going back to the ethical um, aspects, one of our suggestions is to have what we call embedded ethics. So there has to be an ethics person in the team from the very start who will be right there on the side of the computer scientists and the domain experts to make sure that everyone's uh, rights and, and, um, and liberties are, are, are being respected. And that is also part of the modeling part so that uh, in the end, um, the, you won't have any algorithms that will permeate or even magnify the inequities that we see now. Great, thank you. Yeah, and we've got some other questions that I see here in the chat that really are getting along those same lines about, um, magnifying the inequities and how do you make these kinds of decisions. Um, I think I'll shift quickly to one that is a little bit different and this one I think was um, more directed for uh, John Sue and it's about elaborating on the privacy preserving digital um, regarding digital contract tracing and have there been breaches and concerns about reliability and how those been dealt with? 
Um, there are, uh, so uh, I think the right way to, of, um, of, of describing it is not breaches, um, but more like there has been uh, design uh, debates and questions, uh, extensive questions about uh, on, on this, uh, on, on the digital contact tr uh, tracing. So um, for example, there has been a huge discussion about centralized and decentralized versions. Centralized version uh, being um, more open to privacy uh, violations. So um, the UK and France was going that direction and I believe both of them, UK for sure, but I believe France also aborted that um, that uh, path. Uh, so it's not a breach, but it's sort of like the, um, they have changed their direction, uh, understanding the ethical issues. Um, in terms of uh, reliability, so um, it, let me say one more thing about this. Uh, the, uh, the privacy preserving uh, system is basically where all the data stays in your phone and all the, uh, the, the processing is done in your phone. The only thing that is being uh, that leaves your phone is basically the uh, in the the non de identified and anonymous little uh, codes that will be pinging people without no one will know who is pinging whom or anything of that sort about the fact that they've been exposed to someone who has been confirmed to be infected. Uh, so that's the privacy system. And if all of these pings go to a central server, there is more. Uh, uh, possibility of being a, a breach, privacy breach, basically. Uh, in terms of reliability, uh, the big debate has been about false positives and uh, false negatives, uh, namely the false positives, because uh, the, the system works when the devices, your phone and the person that is near you, uh, exchanging uh, little uh, IDs, uh, the, the um, uh, random IDs. Um, when they are within two meters of distance for longer than 15 minutes. And the issue about this is that if this happens, for example, with the next door neighbor, that there is a wall in between, um, well, the device might not, the device will not realize this, so it will be pinging and you might get a, uh, you might be um, unnecessarily notified. Um, so the false positive question comes here. Uh, but of course, as Leo said about the earlier question, uh, we have to think about it in comparison to what is the manual contact tracer tracing's error rate. And for that, we have to properly implement the digital contact tracing, test it, and understand its um, error rate properly before we make a uh, huge decision. So the, the disappointing thing is that this is not what is being done. Countries are not um, implementing it in a, test, in, a, in a test case and then understanding how it works and then deciding their national strategies. Instead, they are sort of like going blindly with um, a messy way of uh, implementing, trying to implement these systems. And we've been discussing this since March. The protocols have been ready since March, March so it's been a while. Great, thank you, John Sue. We're just about at our time. So um, just a couple of quick reflections. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you for not only being here with us, but just the incredible work that you're doing every day um, around these important issues. But you know, it just feels like context is so important with these tools and the human interaction with these tools is really what can make or break them. Um, and just this need that you've all highlight, highlighted that these tools can help balance human bias and reduce, reduce health inequities if it's done well. Um, but if it's not done well, there are risks are that we can actually compound these inequities. And this idea that you brought up about just making sure that ethics are embedded, and Leo, you talking about having ethics persons embedded in the team, um, Edson, the things that you've been talking about, um, in Brazil and making sure that the ethics are looked at in the socioeconomic context. And John Su, all of your work around um, looking at the ethics around all of these tools feel like it just kind of continues to be the really critical element between um, using these to reduce inequities or possibly compounding them. Um, so thank you again to all of you. Um, Megan, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you for um, a final wrap up. Great. Thank you so much, Kirsten. That officially concludes our eighth and 
final Data Science in AI Summits for Healthcare webinar. Many thanks to our panelists, John Sue, Leo, Edson, and Kirsten for driving this incredible discussion and for all the work that you are doing as part of the COVID-19 response. We know how busy you are and deeply appreciate the time that you've spent with us here today. And to our audience, thank you for joining us and submitting thought-provoking questions. For those, of us, for those who have joined us for multiple webinars, it's been such a pleasure having you along for the ride, and we hope you walked away from these discussions having learned something new, thinking about a problem from a different perspective, or inspired to start a new project. These webinars have brought together experts from around the globe and across sectors and industry. We've heard from a diverse set of voices, from colleagues working in the field in Sierra Leone to the Chief Information Officer at the World Health Organization. While every panelist brought a unique perspective, each was committed to thinking about how we can best use technology for good as part of the COVID-19 response. Lastly, I wanna thank all the team members who made this series possible, to our colleagues at the Novartis Foundation, Anne, Lucy, Johannes, and Carolyn, you've been tremendous thought partners in the series and it would not have been possible without your support and engagement. Thank you to the HGHI team, Carissa, Luke, Ellie, and Stephanie, who have made it possible to reach audiences around the world with rich content. And a special shout out to our colleague, Caroline, who has been running the tech behind the scenes, flawlessly putting out unexpected fires so no one notices, creating flyers, and ensuring that these important discussions are broadcasted globally. And with that, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon or evening and take care of yourselves and others. It has been an honor and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.